Let's jump ahead for a minute. Um, let's talk about the Dream Theater audition. I, I want to know if... Can you say at this point, looking back, like, was that something you really, really, really wanted? Or was it like, eh, 80% wanted it? Well, I, uh, yeah, I think it wasn't, I didn't really, really, really want it. And maybe, I don't know if that was visible or people could uh, feel no, it. But I'm not saying like, I, I, I could see it on that documentary right. or anything that was made. I'm saying, I'm wondering. No, I didn't, you know, for me it was a surprise. And when the management called me, I said no mm -hmm. the first time. And then they said, it, I was a bit of back and forth about various you know, issues in the setup of this whole thing. And I said, I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think I'll be part of that. Did you like it? Did you like that? Did you even know it? I knew it, of course. I knew it. And, um, you know, I was, I'm a huge progressive rock and progressive metal fan. And I, I played with some of the original progressive rock guys, like, you know, UK, John Wayne, et etc. particularly and, liked Dream. And I, I wasn't a fan. No, That's what I'm asking. I wasn't a fan. But I had a lot of respect for what they were doing. And and I wasn't really educated enough to to make a, a sort of a competent, educated decision. I didn't know all their stuff, so I thought maybe if their fan base is so huge. Maybe I'm just one of those idiots who never really got into their stuff, and maybe I'll love it. I don't know. Okay. So I I gave them and their whole thing the benefit of the doubt, you know, from my perspective, and said maybe I just maybe I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't like it because I don't know it. The reason why I did in the end is I wanted to see what the heck was up, you know, and why, what this is. Was it basically. more that, the curiosity? It was like... the curiosity, purely. And, and I, Virgil's a very good friend of mine. Virgil and I spoke before this, and, also, and Derek also, Derek Roddy, and, and Achilles is a great friend of mine. So we all spoke before the audition, and, uh, and Mike Mangini, and, so, and Portnoy too. I mean, we're all friends, you know, and some closer than others, but we're all friends. Had and you spoken to Portnoy before this? or Before, I spoke to Portnoy as well. What did he say? Um, he's about doing the audition. Or? I mean, and in other words, was it, was, was it a kind of situation where, where you felt like, Thomas, if you're really my friend, you wouldn't do this? Or, no, or was he like, hey, go get him, man, you know? I felt sorry for him because, you know, at the same time, and this is... Um, well, it was you know I felt sorry because obviously it was his band. He he just lost something that was very important to him, and I felt like uh, somebody was, you know, he was in obviously in pain and also in shock, and I don't think uh, he he minded anybody else auditioning. Actually, I think he preferred uh, to know that some of his personal friends were auditioning for the band. You okay, know, I think okay, it was so. better than some unknown person. I don't know. I may be wrong, but. It didn't seem like it was inappropriate or anything to audition or to agree to show up at all. You didn't all. feel like you were dating his ex-wife? No, ex -wife. no, he'd known it. No, exactly. I didn't. It, it didn't no. feel like that. No, not at all. Gotcha. And, and also, after the audition, when we spoke about it, you know, we were both totally cool about it. It's like, hey, and he asked me, like, what was going on? Have, do you know anything? Et cetera, et cetera. Also, at the same time, when he was working with Avenged Sevenfold, I, you know, Mike Elizondo, who's here in Westlake, he lives here, and he's a producer who produced Avenged Sevenfold, at the same time I heard about the Dream Theater gig, I heard about the fact that he was no longer in Avenged Sevenfold, which he didn't know at the time. And and I was asked to come and, and audition for Avenged Sevenfold the same day I was I get I got the, got the call for Dream Theater. Wow. Which, of course, Avenged is not for me. And I went and did the audition. Oh, you did? I, yeah, I went there because Mike is like literally two minutes from here. Let's hell? see what's going on what's... because I was recommended by a very close friend, Greg Bissonnette, who is my, my neighbor. Yeah, you we're know, gonna get so, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> think, did you go in there and say to the guys, "Guys, come on, this is"? No, I, I, no, I just, I, you know, slaughtered the songs, man. <laughs> right, I just right, right. played them, you know, as the best I could, of sure, course, sure. and totally killed it. Yeah, and um, but I also knew that I would like to maybe make a connection with, with with the producer or somebody involved in the project on a different level, but I didn't think I would be the right guy f to play and tour with them absolutely right, not right right however with dream theater after doing all my research and 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 investigating a little bit and and being into that kind of music oh i i knew i could do totally that would be right up my alley musically but 
I had to make a decision creatively, like, am I going to play everything the way Mike played it and play every fill sort of in that world and play that style or try to make it my own? And I didn't want to do anything other than make it my own. So by making that decision, you have a 50-50 chance of getting the gig in the first place or not. So, and not only were they looking for something else, somebody who maybe would play the parts a lot more like they are on the record, but also... Um, you know, it's, 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 there were many factors involved, personal things. And, if, you know, people usually associate sort of an addition only with the playing aspect and sort of the command over the instrument of music, which is the smallest part of it. Depends very much on whether you like the people and the people like you or not. And I like the people and I think they like me too, but there were, there's also other elements, you know, budget questions, logistical issues, you know fees etc 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 so much must be considered and 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 you know many options have to be weighed out and you know i'm really happy about that for because for me it was a great uh, positive experience you know it was awesome and uh, i enjoyed playing with them and and learning the songs and having the challenge and i think i again i totally nailed it to the floor and i felt great and i i wanted to play it the way i play the music and it, from my point of view, I killed it mm-hmm. because that's the way I I approach the music, and and I you either like it or you don't, and it's not f- me trying to sound arrogant because it's their music, mm-hmm. but if if they like you know if they're more like if they like that approach, they would have loved it, but I don't think they liked that approach. Okay. If you know what I mean, yeah, yeah. and um, because I remember looking back, they asked me about hey how you know what kind of drum set are you gonna use, and I said. I'll use a four-piece kit if you if you want. I, I used whatever drums they had in the in the in the um, studio for the audition, and I didn't set up. They had all the octobons and gong drums and like fifteen tom toms there and everything else, and I didn't set up the whole thing because there wasn't enough time. First of all, secondly, the monitor situation was difficult in your monitoring, and so I just kept it min- minimal. And but I I kind of later just kind of found out that. They were looking for somebody who said, well, dude, my, I, I set up half the stage will be drums. Because yeah. they were of that sort of, yeah. you know. And I thought maybe after having been with Portnoy for all these years, maybe they're looking forward to a drummer who's only got like a four-piece kit. Because right. sound checks will be shorter and gear will be cheaper to transport and set up and this and that. But no, they were going for like all out. Right. And they're looking at Mike Mangini's kit now. Yeah. You know, yeah. look at the freaking thing. So... You know, I was thinking more like Mars Volta, you know, and I was thinking more like old school progressive, like I can do this on a yeah. freaking four piece and I could kill it, you know. Yeah. And um, but they were of a different philosophy generally, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But again, in the end, it was a great experience and a lot of fun. And and I think, you know, it's great. They chose the right guy. You know, he's East Coast. He's local. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, a yeah. lot of things, again, like I said, to be considered, one of which is budgets. So if you have a guy who's local, that eliminates a lot of problems and costs. You don't have to fly him in for And you don't have to get work visas and international <sighs> mm-hmm. travel and overseas stuff and accommodation. and whole, That alone will help, help make a decision, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. That's a really yeah, good point. Especially considering yeah. that was their last record for Roadrunner and many other things. <laughs> also, let me just mention this because there's so much gossip about this. You know, obviously, uh, Dream Theater audience is, is half guitar players, half drummers, basically, if you look at the musical audience that yeah. they have. Half of the fans are drummers, or at least air drummers. Yeah. And <laughs> in, with Mike Portner being gone, they potentially lose half of their audience. Mm. You know, so they really had to do something to appeal to the drum audience. They had to do something publicity-wise, marketing-wise, to put it out there that they're still going to be amazing, even with a new drummer. And there is no other way that you could get seven of the world's best and most relevant drummers to play Dream Theater music unless you call it an audition. Right. If you know what I mean, yeah, because it wouldn't be affordable. And film it. And film it and release it as a product. Did you know this beforehand? No, right. nobody was, did. No, you didn't know. No, well, I I knew. And words, you part got of the reason there why I said cameras around. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That I didn't know because that was the hang up in the beginning when I said I'm not going to do it because they tro- they sent me a, a release contract or consent form at first, 
for filming. And I said, what's this for? And they said, well, it's, we want to review you know, the performances. The band wants to go home and check and look at it and compare and analyze. And I'm like, that's fair. Right, sounds, that's, sounds cool. Okay. And, and then... But then there was a consent a, form for that. Yeah, to to allow people to film you and record you. But I thought it was that was usually for releasing. No, that's a release form. Okay. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Fair a, enough. That was a different enough. form. Okay. okay. Which um, then, when that form okay. came, I became obviously a little bit suspicious and said, and I had a lot of conversations about this with the other guys. Because you felt like wait, this was the plan from the beginning, and you of weren't course, completely on right. Right. And you know, my wife being a publicist, yeah, yeah. and I work in the industry, and I've been there long so enough. I'm saying, you to feel know. like fuck you. What do you think I was? I just came off the uh, right, the exactly. boat. I mean, why are you treating me like this? So well, I mean, they did send it beforehand, and you have the choice to either say yes or no. But at that point, I was ready to go. I mean, I was like ready to get on a plane. You know, so it was like. But, but I had, just just to clear the, the timeline. In other words, you're saying they sent you the consent form to say we're going to videotape you for for our use. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. You go, you do it. You're being filmed afterwards. They're saying, oh, we, now we want to release it. Well, no, no, it was before. It was still it was, before. Yeah, the it was still before. So you know, I was aware. But at that point, sort of it, I, this whole spiel had progressed so much that I'd learned the songs, I'd prepared for this thing, and I'd, I've agreed to show up and book, and they'd booked the flight, and right. they'd given me the cameras to film myself preparing and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's many aspects to this. In fact, I did send me a camera to film myself preparing because they wanted to see... And they sent me a questionnaire, and I don't know if this is confidential information or any of the other drummers. I think a lot of the other drummers have t talked about this already, so I don't care. And this is probably by now common knowledge anyways. But they sent me like a questionnaire and things like that, which I I felt like was totally cool. Because if I'm looking for a new guy in my band, I want to know stuff about him. What so, kind of questions were there? Are they like really personal? Question, yeah, stuff? personal questions, like loads of them. There's a whole like 60 question or whatever. It was like pages of uh, questions. And they said, can, can you film yourself answering these questions? Oh, and okay. and I said, totally f cool. And they sent me a camera and I filmed myself doing this stuff. And um, and then when that form came, the second... Uh, like the, the release form. The release form or the consent for release form, the second one, exactly. Okay. Um, I... You know, obviously the red flag sort of came up for me and it was, ah, okay, I know where this is going now and this is not the way I see this happening. So I disagreed to them using any of this footage. They used some of the other guys' footage of themselves preparing at home and stuff like that. Gotcha. But, I mean, I I thought, okay, now this isn't... The initial contract and agreement we had in consent form was, and the first emails was about a private and confidential audition. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, with the arrival of the camera, the questionnaire, and the second contract, it was no longer a private and confidential audition. It suddenly reeked of product uh -huh. to me. And I said, no, at that point. I, I'm not coming. And that's when they said, oh, come on, it wouldn't be complete without you, and it would be great for you, and all the publicity, and imagine this, and imagine that. And I'm like, I don't think I need that publicity necessarily to be one of the seven guys who didn't get the gig. Right, right, right. Maybe that's not the publicity I want. Yeah. You know, and uh, and I, I, we talked amongst us, Virgil and Derek and Achilles and I, and actually I was just, at the time, I was in Brazil in South America, so I was on the road when I was preparing for this with Paulina Rubio, I was doing a South American tour, and I, it was very hard to prepare for this audition because I was touring and playing every night on a four-piece kit, I didn't have the drums, and <laughs> anyways, but I met Achilles in Brazil just before, and, and we talked about it, and I was on the phone to Virgil about this a bunch of times, And at one point, Virgil said, listen, I'm just going to do it. You know, I don't care. You know, I'm just going to do it and see what's, what's up. And, you know, I signed this thing and I, I know what they're doing. And obviously it's, it's a way of, you know, they, they have to drum up some publicity. It's, it's a little and, dirty. And marketing. It just sounds like it was the plan from the beginning. Of course and they it just was. told you, and you piece know by piece. Of course it was. Fair enough. Great marketing yeah, ploy. Yeah. Great f management. Super idea. And what what can you say? Uh, it's not unfair. I mean, do you it, think that was points against you though? Going in, like, were you the one guy? They were like, 
Well, he's difficult. Okay, he's a, he's a, a difficult bit, guy. Of course, I, I when when I first met management, I mean, after all that, after right. I said no, basically a bunch of times, and I said, I don't think this is you you this is private and confidential anymore. If you right. plan to release any of this, right? Uh, of course, there was that sort of aspect. Yes, yeah. and so I went in from that angle, yeah. which made it more difficult, probably. Yeah. I can imagine Mangini. I guess was just from the get go. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but. Um, Good experience overall. I mean, for me, it was a great fun yeah. experience, and it was a very. Did it help you? Like, with the, they were, you know, mentioning the publicity. Did Did you see any kind of? No, no, no. Okay. I mean, I what I saw and and have experienced since then is a lot of questions like, you know, this at the clinics like, sure, what was sure, it like? Sure. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> I think it, maybe it put me on the radar with some of the dream theater. Yeah. drum fans who didn't know me before maybe it was good but it also put me on the list of the seven guys who didn't get the gig <laughs> if you know what i mean yeah but see now with this and anyone anyone listening to this for example knows okay like, well like you're think, saying you, this so wasn't a regular audition is all we're establishing no it was, was regularly on any level right. i mean it's it wasn't regular because it wasn't confidential and private first of all it wasn't regular because the audition itself was like no other audition I've ever experienced or heard of. It's super long and very sort of in-depth and, and sort of complex and challenging on many levels musically. And also, uh, of course, it wasn't a regular audition because it was being filmed and multi-track recorded. Yeah. So that kind of pressure and added pressure is a whole adds a whole other dimension of challenge to it. And it wasn't a normal audition because the the, the decision process was public. You know, they had announced that they're looking for a drummer, and then they said, "Well, in two weeks, in you know, one week, we will know." So it was a it was a public selection it process. It was like American Idol. Yes, for, it for, was right? a little yeah. weird, yeah. you know, yeah. in that sense. So on no level was it a normal audition, yeah. but that was the point. I mean, it was like the Metallica thing with Robert Trujillo, uh, only in in on their scale. I mean, they didn't give anybody a million dollars up right, front to be right. in the band, but they did whatever they could to drum up as much publicity. You know, so they could keep their audience, you know, focused and interested and believing in the band, and it worked. I yeah, think. You totally. Know? So uh, well, I mean, kudos to them and and their manager for that idea. Yeah. Me yeah. as a as a hobby, you know, marketing man and publicist. My wife being a publicist, you know, we looked at this and went, "Sure, genius. How else could you get seven guys? You could never afford to pay for right. Virgil Donati and Derek Roddy and Achilles <laughs> Priest and, and all these guys to fly to New York, yeah. learn the music beforehand." And then agree to the filming, agree to the multi-track recording, agree to a release. You can never afford to do that unless you say it's an audition. See, that's the interesting thing. You say, you, you put it like, I'm one of the seven guys who didn't get the gig. And I'm almost thinking, in a way, you did get the gig. You're one of the seven guys who did get the gig. In other words, they get to say, look at all these drummers, well, these great names sure, and, that, and we, I mean, that I, we did I'm, work with. You know, in a sense. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm more they than... They did choose you. You follow me? Uh, yeah, I know. Chosen, I, I was in on the short list, and it's a it's a big honor, and it's yeah. a great honor, and I'm in really great company with all those guys, so. and of course, I'm and I feel very honored in that sense. But at the same time, um, you're better friends with Mike Portnoy now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yes, absolutely. I'm good friends with Mike, and I'm He's, still great he, friends with Mike Mangini. I mean, we're all friends. It's never yeah, but it's not, that's a different thing. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how Mike Portnoy and Mike Mangini are. Too. Oh, they were friends before too, and I'm sure they still are. I don't know if, if, if they're as any, close. Oh, I, I wouldn't think so. You, you I, don't think it has? I don't not, think it has anything to do with that. No, no. I mean, they're everybody's you know, an adult, and although I, I, I'm sure it means a lot to Mike Portnoy and to Mike Mangini by now. I I'm, I'm think I think they can put that aside and yeah. and you know be friends and colleagues like they were before I'm sure. Gotcha. Um, but again, being in reality, although having been on the short list and and having been of the whole you know sort of ex part of the experience, at the end of the day, in reality, you have to or if me personally being the skeptic that I am and being the realist that I am, in reality, I look at it as as um, yeah, you are on the list of the seven people who tried and didn't get the gig at the end of the day. So, and it, it doesn't bother me, you know, but, but it, it is that. If you look at the the equivalent in the movie industry, if you know that, you know, Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man now, 
who was up for the part. You who mean? else is, was up for the part? You never know who else. Maybe two years later you find out that yeah. you know, Hugh Jackman said no to the role or sure. somebody's agent said no. But <laughs> if you actually see the list of everybody who auditioned who didn't get the gig, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a different experience. And then why would everybody talk about the people who don't get the gig? It's because it's not public. You know, yeah. they, you don't see everybody auditioning. Right. You it don't becomes s- a fast fact. Did you know? That? Exactly. Yeah. But in this case, imagine you, you release sort of the audition uh, reel of, you know, Hugh Jackman and, I don't know, Leif Schreiber and all these people auditioning for Iron Man yeah. and eventually Robert Downey Jr. getting it. How would Hugh Jackman feel about that? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If, you know, his audition is being released... And maybe it makes him a bigger man, you know, personally. Maybe it makes him sort of puts him on the radar of Iron Man fans who didn't know him before. But really, you know, <laughs> is that a good thing necessarily? Yeah, I, got, I see you what know? you're saying, man. But again, it's, it's amazing. You and your wife, as you were saying, you saw through this whole thing. You did get well, it. You yeah. got it. And you just went, okay. Yeah, we, we know it before. Yeah, we, yeah, we're yeah, fully yeah. aware of it. And, yeah, it's fascinating, yeah. And we had the conversation with management and they said listen it's it would just not be complete without you <laughs> our ploy would not work out you know we need, we you, need you exactly right right right, right. no yeah. it was it was fun yeah 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 um